again, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Piyush for that. Uh, I'm sure that was a very nice perspective on the retail uh, segment. We are now moving on to uh, the next topic, which is uh, dawn of the machine learning era in uh, healthcare. We have with us uh, Arnab Bose, who is managing director at Abzuba and lecturer at the University of uh, Chicago. He's a 20-year uh, veteran who enjoys working with uh, data and has extensive uh, analytics experience in healthcare and finance. He's also a consultant for analytics and automated uh, vehicle control. He's a lecturer in the University of Chicago, Master of Science in Analytics, where he teaches time series analysis and forecasting in health uh, analysis. So please join us welcoming uh, Arnab Bose on the dais. Um, hi, everyone. I, uh, I know a lot of people might be looking forward to <laughs> lunch. Uh, that's right after this. So, uh, But uh, we'll just get started. So you know, one of the things that um, I wanted to focus on for today's talk was how machine learning and everything that you read about. We saw a lot of talks on retail. And um, healthcare as an industry is a little still behind um, retail and, of course, also finance. And, but there is still a lot of penetration that is happening in healthcare. And the purpose of this talk, or what I wanted to present, was some of the you know, key challenges that are happening in healthcare from analytics perspective, and talk a bit about like what's the possible roadmap ahead. So with that, you know, I'll just go quickly, and this is a very generic um, introduction, but one thing that I wanted to touch upon is that uh, data analytics is big nowadays, right? Like every one of you is either working on the field or you're interested in getting into this field. But the key is that this is not something new that's been happening, or that's recently happened. There, it started off all the way back with Aristotle, and he came up with this whole concept called epagog, which was um, the theory of induction. So his idea was that you know, we as humans are interacting with nature and with other things, and that interaction is through our sense perception. And when we have those interactions, we develop what are called memories. And when you have multiple memories of the same thing, you have what is called an experience. And you know, what is interesting is that this interaction, obviously we are talking about you know, uh, quite some time back. So what, was, what is now happening, if you fast forward, is that the same interaction, the same philosophy continues today, where with the advent of computers, and with cheap data storage, right? all we are trying to do is we are trying to understand the phenomena around us. And we are leveraging the vast volume of data to help us through that understanding. So specifically today, what we will look at is journey through a healthcare system. So you know, we all are, at one time or the other, we become a patient. And we go to visit a physician. Then from the physician, we get a you know, certain prescription. We get a medication. Hopefully, we don't get hospitalized. Um, either way, we get an insurance claim. And then after the insurance claim, there's also a question of quality of service that was provided. And finally, there's some talk of providing some kind of an intervention to change the health outcome. So what we'll do is we'll walk through this journey as we have multiple touch points in the healthcare system, and we'll see where and how machine learning, data analytics, you know, how it has penetrated into the healthcare system. So we start with a visit to the physician, right? Like you go to your doctor, and you, know, you, have a, you go there for a common cold or any other, any other ailment. Right? And one of the things that machine learning and data is doing right now is providing this approach, which is called population health. So it has a few key components, which we'll look at in subsequent slides. One is risk stratification. Then you also have something called risk adjustment. And I'll talk about what they mean. And obviously, you have thereafter some forecasting models. Then you also have 
you might have heard about this personalized medicine, right, genetics, where the genome sequencing has been done using advanced techniques. And finally, you have um, electronic medical records, which is more popular, or it's becoming more popular in places like the US. And it leverages the concept of what is known as evidence-based medicine. So starting with population health, what it means is you try to segment your population to understand the key challenges, the healthcare challenges, so that you can have a more directed approach to a healthcare delivery or a healthcare solution. Okay. So, I mean, if you have a population, say that population segmentation can be by geography. So, for example, you know, in Eastern India, in Kolkata, you have a dengue outbreak right now, right? So that would be a population health approach towards solving an epidemic, right? Or it could also have an, you could also do a population segmentation based on age and your family history. So if you have, like me, if you have both parents who are diabetic, right, then you fall, like I fall in a very high diabetes risk, pre-diabetic group. And what that does is when you go and visit, to the, visit your doctor, your doctor, your physician already has all this data. And so the, so the physician knows what medicines to give you, what questions to ask, so as to reduce your risk of developing a particular chronic disease. Okay. So this is more of an aggregated health approach. So it's like you know that someone from my background, my age group, who leads my kind of a lifestyle, has these characteristics. And so it's an aggregated approach. As a, and what that allows you to do is, it allows you to do some kind of a risk stratification. So if you're leading a life where you know, you're out of, the, out of your house by 8 a.m., you're working hard, you're back, you know, you're working till 8 p.m., your, you know, your eating habits are all skewed, right? What it does is it allows you to develop risk stratification models where you know that these people or a particular individual, because of her or his you know, habits, lifestyle habits, are predeclined to certain risks. And through healthcare delivery and interaction with a physician, what you try to do is you try to reduce those risks. And it's all driven through data, right? So if, you are, you know, if, I, am, if I like to eat rich foods or if I have to eat, you know, like to eat um, you know, certain kind of my, uh, you know, my food or my lunch profile, if we have the data towards that, that can be used to deliver a more, a better diagnosis. That's a risk stratification. And you know, there are multiple ways to handle that. Um, the other thing is a risk adjustment. So the way it differs from a risk stratification is that you can think of it this way, right? Like if you have two physicians who are operating, one of them is in, say, the Bangalore hub, right, Bengaluru hub, where you have a profile of your patients who are, say, you know, they are IT, they have, you know, they have, a, they have more sophistication, they are higher educated. And you take a similar physician who is working in one of the villages, right, out, outside the city, who is doing the same treatment, but now your population profile is very different. The education level is very different. The sophistication of the population is very different. So when you take these two physicians who are delivering the same health, you know, the same outcome, who are trying to get to the same outcome, but they have different results, do you penalize then a, you know, a physician who is actually dealing with a different population segment? Or to put it other way, how do you compare the outcomes of this to different populations? So that's where your risk adjustment comes in. So, I mean, a big case where this is used is that in, in certain cities, right, where you have inner cities, uh, you have a population that has a lower income, and you have these physicians who are going there to do treatments, as opposed to you know, going to a rich neighborhood where you're trying out the same treatment. Your outcomes will be very different. But at the end of the day, what you need to do is, if you want to generate some public health mandates, you need to be able to compare apples to apples. And that's where your risk adjustment comes in. And finally, what you would like to do is, you have all this data, you have your 
risk stratification, you have risk adjustments, and you, know, you establish a trend where you, have, you see what your history is telling you, and then you try to extrapolate that trend into the future, which is what are clinical prediction models. So you have you know, different kinds of outcomes. So you can have a continuous outcome where you know, you're doing like a blood pressure, right? Like you're trying to see a patient's blood pressure over time, and then based on the characteristics of that trend, you try to do a prediction of what the blood pressure would be over, say, the next few days or, over, or the week. That, that allows you to, you know, you have a specific model category to use, as opposed to, say, you do a binary outcome, which is more like, you know, are you diabetic or are you not diabetic? Are you going to develop a heart disease or are you not going to develop a heart disease? So these are all different data models that have applications specific to the healthcare arena. I mean, what that is very interesting is that they came up with this um, in the UK. They have this thing called the Glasgow Outcome Score, which is, um, which is like, um, you know, it's, um, it's an ordinal outcome. So ordinal means you have ordered data, but you have multiple levels where they try to analyze a patient who's had a brain trauma, something, you know, like through an accident. So you have different, so it's not, it's not whether the patient has the trauma or not, it's more like the degree of trauma. So again, you have separate data models that can access and that can analyze and address these specific needs. Finally, you know, personalized medicine, right, like we talked about, so it's, it's like using your response to a particular drug or using uh, a genome sequencing to understand. So what population health, risk stratification, everything does is it tells me, say, for example, the people in this room, right, you fit a particular uh, healthcare, say, prescription. But that's still an aggregated viewpoint. Now, uh, personalized medicine, what it does is it's a bottom-up approach where you take an individual's response to a particular drug, allergies, right, like what are your predispositions, and you try to integrate that with population health to determine a better healthcare approach for an individual. It's more a customized approach for personalized health. And one of the, you know, one of the things that we, we are, there's an example is that there is a drug called Plavix, which what it does is it's, it's, an, it's an anticoagulant, like it's a blood thinner. But for that drug to work effectively, your body has to interact in terms of an enzyme. And what was discovered is that one third of the people, or one third of the patients who were recommended that drug did not have that enzyme reaction. So the, even though the drug fit the population profile, even though the drug, drug fit that, okay, you know, this particular, particular person needs this Plavix, but the person's body response to that drug was not per the norms. And the understanding was that because, you know, such people had less than normal activity, enzymic activity. Now, what it, the key thing is that if, as a physician, if as a healthcare system, you have these understanding through data, then what it does is it enables you to have a more effective outcome. And you know, the key at all times is to have data analytics, right, to, to cater to the social good, right? Like, why are we doing this? It's always good to know, right? It's always great to know that, okay, you know, this population has this problem, these people are pre-diabetic, you know, you, you might have a, you know, like I might have some problems. But the, I, the key is, can that be an actionable insight? Can you make a difference using your tools, using data analytics? And that difference leads to someone maybe leading a better life, leads someone to have a longer life. Then, you know, the, the other thing that comes out into electronic medical records is that, so electronic medical record, for those of you who don't know, is that you go to a particular physician, that physician has um, an electronic chart of what your diseases were, what you were using for prescription medicines, how you reacted, what are your lab results, right? Now, that chart has two parts to it. 
There's a templatized part. It's like, okay, you know, gender, age, click, click, click. Then there's also a, a free form part where your doctor writes down what she or he has seen, how you, know, how you have reacted to some questions. That templatized, that free form part is natural language processing. If you can use NLP tools, and I'm sure you've heard about a lot of NLP tools, but if they can be used to extract the insights from those free form and combined with your template, then you have a complete understanding of the patient, at least complete from the sense that, you know, to the point of the physician visit. And all of these, you know, they sound good. Most of it, you can argue that it, theoretically it's great, but definitely they have their own challenges, right? Um, especially like when you talk about, say, freeform text. I and mean, we have all seen, you know, when a, when a physician writes a prescription, right? It's very difficult for me to understand what's going on, right? Like it's all filled with abbreviations. It's very written very quickly, right? So, you know, like there can be very, um, you know, medical jargons that we won't understand. So you can imagine the challenges that come up when you have a machine trying to interpret those and use that as an information for the, phys uh, for the patient. Once you get into a hospital, right, which hopefully, you know, like um, won't happen, but in a hospital, there are different, um, you know, like you have, you get into a hospital, you get a discharge. Now, what happens is that sometimes 